Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Kishore Mabubani. I'm the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, the National University of Singapore. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this panel on rebuilding trust in Asia. Now, as you know, Davos, we discuss many globally significant issues. But I suspect that the discussion that we are having, that we're going to have this morning, is probably going to touch one of the most important issues of our time. And I say this because, as you know, for a long time I've maintained that the 21st century will be the Asian century. I think that we know. What we don't know is whether it'll be a happy century or an un un unhappy century. <laughs> and, you know, we've seen both sides uh, of the coin. I remember exactly a year ago in Davos in January 2014 when I was here, the one question that everybody was asking me in the corridors uh, was, will there be war between China and Japan in 2014? Luckily, I took bets with several people, gave them 10 to 1 odds, and I collected my bets in Davos, January 2015. <laughs> so you can see I have a lot of confidence uh, in the underlying stability uh, of the region. But despite that, of course, you know, there are real issues, real challenges uh, that we have to deal with. And there are significant trust deficits uh, in this region. So what we plan to do this morning is for in the, initially to try and see whether we can do a good analysis of what are the deeper uh, sources of these trust deficits. And then we'll move on from there to, to see whether we can suggest solutions or ways and means of uh, improving the situation uh, in the region. And towards the end, we'll also call in uh, you members of the audience to come in with some uh, tough and um, bracing questions. As you know, this session is on the record. Uh, it's being webcast on a Saturday morning. Of course, as you know, it's difficult to fill uh, the room. But uh, the good news is that there's a large audience watching out there, uh, both today and in future also. Now, I won't introduce the panel at great length. You all know we have a remarkably uh, distinguished uh, panel here. Uh, I'll introduce each one of them with one line as I pose the first question to them. And then we will try to have, we agreed, by the way, we conspired before this event, there'll be no long speeches. Uh, instead, we'll have a robust uh, to and fro uh, uh, this morning to keep make sure that we all awake on a Saturday morning. <laughs> so Dr. Kill, I'm going to start with you. Dr. Kill has been a former diplomat, a former journalist, and now a, a politician. And of course, the, when we talk of trust deficits uh, that involve Korea, uh, it's very clear that there is, I mean, without a shadow of doubt, uh, a kind of a trust deficit between Korea and Japan, reflected both on maritime issues and other issues. And if you had to give a very brief kind of uh, analysis of the, what you see as the deeper sources of this trust deficit, what would you say? Well, anyway, uh, this is my honor always. And, uh, but I think this is a pity or a kind of shame for major East Asian countries are now talking about the rebuilding trust in the region. Uh, considering uh, the e economic uh, importance of uh, those three countries in Northeast Asia, uh, and considering many uh, different kind of issues of each country is contributing to the region and uh, as, as a world in general, we can do it better as a matter of fact. We can share a kind of uh, geographic proximity, and we are sharing uh, cultural heritage. But I think uh, all the three, uh, three countries, major countries, China, Japan, and Korea, are now playing the game of self-defeating. So uh, the, my message is we can do it better. You maybe heard about the kind of East Asian paradox, economically prosperous, but uh, we are still suffering from political tensions. And such political tensions are mostly coming out of our past history. Uh, each country still have sour feelings uh, in our contemporary history. And uh, each political leaders uh, probably have not been courageous enough to kind of break the, the shackles of the past history. And uh, each leader of uh, major countries are still lean on kind of uh, trying to be a lean on the populism. And so I think uh, we are now here, so uh, uh, we should uh, try to find a way out of this kind of self-defeating game. Most kind of tensions, political tensions, 
are coming from the past history. I think you're trying to start us off on an optimistic note, but I, I'll push you a bit later. Sure. And uh, I'm going to ask you later on, as a follow-up question, why can't Korea and Japan do what Germany and France have divin, done, or Germany and UK have done, and they're saying history is history, the future is the future. Think about that for the second question. <laughs> okay, go uh, ahead. Shinbo, of course, as you know, is a very distinguished uh, academic uh, from Fudan University, uh, China. And of course, China, as you know, has also had challenges uh, with its neighbors. Uh, certainly, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, last year everyone thought that China and Japan may possibly come to blows uh, over the disputes uh, on the Senkakuryayu Islands. Uh, and of course, there were issues in the South China Sea and so on and so forth. How do you see China's perspective on this trust deficit? Well, uh, I will tell you what I think, what I personally think about this issue, because in China there may be uh, different views mm. on this issue. I think the challenge, um, uh, challenges are uh, one that in this region, the economic relations are becoming increasingly regional in terms of the uh, integration and interdependence. But politically, uh, it remains very much national, or sometimes the politics in a country is very much local, even personal. So you look at the trends in this region, economically integration, but politically very much you know, driven by uh, a respective national agenda or even partisan agenda, local agenda. So that creates a lot of um, tension uh, in relations among countries. And another reason, is, uh, another reason uh, for this is uh, we have seen the rapid change in the balance of power in this region because of the rise of China and because of the rapid development of other countries. So this kind of shift in balance of power always uh, leads to uh, concern and anxiety. And we haven't been able to uh, or, or come up with a new regional framework that will accommodate this uh, changing uh, power balance and uh, and make every member in this region to have a shared vision about the, the future of this region. So I think if we are going to address the issue of uh, trust deficit, we really need to think about a shared vision for the future and shared agenda for this region. So that's the direction we should move toward. Good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're taking a slightly different approach. Uh, Dr. Kiel spoke about the historical dimension. You speak about the shift, the balance of power, which is also causing a new tension. So let me turn to my good friend Akihiko Tanaka, uh, uh, distinguished academic who's now uh, a very good bureaucrat <laughs> running JICA, succeeding my good friend Sadaka Ogata. So Akiko, from your point of view, you know, as you know, Japan has got trust deficits with China and with Korea. What's your perspective, and what do, you, what do you see as the underlying causes of all this? Well, thank you, Kisho. It's a great pleasure uh, to be on the same panel with you and uh, also uh, two uh, good friends of mine, uh, uh, Member of Parliament, uh, Mr. Kill and Lewis Um and Prime Minister. <laughs> Prime Minister. <laughs> Prime Minister. <laughs> Certainly. Um, Australia is a footnote. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to pay you well, back I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I agree that there is a trust deficit uh, amongst the uh, Northeast Asian uh, three countries. And I think uh, there are three levels. Yeah. Uh, one is a leadership level. The second, ordinary people's level. Ah. And the third is an extremist level. Ah. And um, that leadership level, I think uh, there are uh, issues of uh, sort of unpredictability of others. Uh, th there are suspicion of what other leaders would do in response to my uh, um, action. And this um, level of uh, mutual suspicion uh, cause a uh, background in which ordinary people are, uh, are reacting. And um, uh, if the two leaders are afraid of uh, uh, seeing each other, then uh, uh, people tend to uh, figure that something wrong in uh, the relations between the two countries. Um, but um, the, uh, I think what uh, uh, make the deficit worse uh, is the existence of extremists in uh, all three countries, uh, particularly uh, working uh, very actively uh, on the net. 
and then they s somehow uh, fanned the mutual suspicions. And, and this uh, could create uh, so the leadership level uh, lack of uh, uh, dialogue, and then uh, extremists' uh, uh, view of each other, uh, fan each other, and then affect the ordinary people's level. And now uh, the situation in the ordinary people's level was, uh, is, is, is uh, quite serious, um, because uh, any uh, opinion surveys we uh, take uh, in Japan, China, and Korea uh, indicate um, that, uh, you know, uh, depending on the countries and depending on the time, but 60% uh, uh, to 80%, 90% of people uh, do not uh, trust the other countries. Um, and so I think um, uh, we need to attend to, both, to all three levels. Um, but uh, I'm uh, quite optimistic um, in the sense um, that um, um, the, the first uh, last year, uh, there uh, has been an improvement in the leadership level. And, and then uh, there is, an, I, I may elaborate this, but there is an increase of ordinary people level interaction uh, amongst the three countries. Um, and then uh, I think, uh, well, Kisho has been in, instrumental in college, uh, you know, university level exchanges in East Asia, uh, but the students are um, uh, becoming uh, friends with each other, uh, st studying in different campuses in, you know, uh, Todai students studying in Seoul National and Beita students studying in, um, in, in Todai and Futan students, uh, or at Futan campus, uh, there, there are Japanese and Korean students. And so I think uh, there are foundations. And then in, con in contrast to the atmosphere last year, uh, uh, this year's uh, conditions is markedly better. Mm. Well, I like this uh, optimism that is flowing through the panel, but I'm going to challenge it in a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Kevin, uh, as you know, Kevin Wright is a former Prime Minister of Australia, but he's also a very distinguished scholar. Uh, he speaks uh, English and Mandarin equally fluently, so I have to remind him today's session is in English. <laughs> I also speak so Australian Kevin, as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, Kevin, you're in a very good position uh, to talk about probably the most important relation across the Pacific, which is the relationship within the world's number one power today, United States, and the world's number one emerging power, China. And of course, the US-China dynamic is also going to inf influence the how events unfold in uh, Asia Pacific and I wonder from from that looking at that particular relationship where do you see the trust deficit stepping back one point yeah. and that is why do we talk about strategic trust mm. that's a really important question in the fundamental strategic logic of China and America if uh, we take as a given that um, security and stability can only be obtained by a balance of power, mm. then I think we are in for a world of pain for a long, long time mm. in this particular relationship. One of the reasons being, uh, from a Beijing perspective, there is no balance of power because an overwhelming United States in terms of its military strength still today, and secondly, supported by an alliance structure around it. That's the core logic. So if that is the underpinning logic to our analysis of what's possible for the future between China and the US and therefore the region, um, then we have a real problem. Hence enter the trust question, which is not, it is a relative question, never an absolute one. Trust within political systems is hard enough, between political systems is hard enough. In Asia in the 21st century, it's trebly hard. So it's not an absolute question. Uh, China and Japan are not going to start trusting each other tomorrow, are they? Um, but it's a relative question of how much trust is adequate to the task of building a cooperative security or strategic project between them and between China and the US. How does um, China view America, therefore, on the trust question? And I spent a lot of time working on this at Harvard Kennedy School this year. Uh, number one, um, is that, and this will surprise many people in this room, but if you drill down uh, within the Chinese leadership and the way in which they view the world, their baseline lack of trust towards America is they don't believe America accepts the legitimacy of the Chinese political system. 
um, and that informs so much else. In fact, the Chinese leadership um, or elements of it uh, consolidated this into a five-point phrase um, midway through last year along the lines of what the United States is engaged in is a process of delegitimizing, undermining um, China, containing China, um, and uh, ultimately overthrowing the Communist Party. Now, that's pretty hardline stuff, but if you are in the Chinese uh, party leadership, this has been a very widespread view for a long period of time. So if you want an element of strategic distrust, there's nothing more distrusting than the view that the other guy actually thinks you're totally illegitimate and wants to get rid of you. So that's number one. Number two is the external domain, and that's the Chinese argument about containment. It, um, and that is not only uh, is there the legitimacy of their regime domestically seen as uh, not right, but therefore the United States is locking them in externally, at least in a security sense. And that has direct geoeconomic implications for them in terms of long-term energy supply. Final point, just as how, do, how do the Americans view all that in return? The United States perceives that the Chinese strategy is kind of along these lines. Uh, number one, uh, that China will wish to avoid any military conflict with uh, the United States for the long-term future, simply because the United States would win because it's overwhelmingly powerful. Uh, number two, the Chinese strategy, as the Americans perceive it, is to economically overwhelm Asia, um, and ultimately, therefore, cause Asia to become more politically compliant to Beijing. That's the American internal conclusion. And a lot proceeds from that underlying strategic logic. Finally, the good news. This Obama-Xi Jinping meeting uh, in November on the back of APEC was probably the best uh, that's been had um, since um, uh, Xi Jinping took over. And the reason is, based on my understanding, and Xing Bo should answer from the Chinese side, I'm just a third party looking at it from the Southern Hemisphere, um, is that these two questions were explicitly addressed in the leaders' discussions with each other. Because unless you are talking about the elephant in the room, in my argument, the two elephants in the room, uh, domestic legitimacy and containment, uh, then frankly, everything else is frankly <coughs> a bit of folk dancing. Yeah. Uh, the second good news, I think, out of this meeting is that there is now the beginnings of a framework, the beginnings of a process to manage the really hard stuff mm -hmm. and, of course, to advance the cooperative stuff in order to trust build over time. Thank you. That was uh, wonderful. I see that Shinbo has raised uh, a two-finger thing, and I'll give it your floor to you in a minute, but I think in the, in the first round, you can see we have touched upon many of the key issues that we have to be addressed, the history issue, uh, the balance of power issue, and as uh, Kevin was also mentioning, the question of domestic legitimacy is also another new factor. And here, the, uh, Shinbo, as you, as you think of your response to, the paradox in, in East Asia is that in theory, the most difficult relationship is always between the number one power and the number one emerging power because there's a real contest down there. Not about those who have had all ancient historical disputes. And surprisingly, it is actually amazing. I'm, I'm genuinely surprised how well the US-China relationship is going in contrast to the China-Japan relationship or the Korea-Japan relationship. So it is, it is and, and that, I agree with Kevin, gives us a lot of hope because if you can take the most difficult relationship in the region and manage it well, then there's hope for the regions. And then maybe others can learn lessons from it too. But Shinbo, when you raise your two fingers, what were you, were you going to agree or disagree with Kevin? I hope you'll disagree. <laughs> uh, we are uh, partly uh, uh, different from uh, what he describes as the, um, the Chinese vision of how um, the US approach China. Uh, when China rises. I think one um, uh, thinking here in China and maybe in other parts of Asia is that uh, when we talk about the deficit of uh, trust in Asia, the US is the single most important external factor uh, affecting this uh, equation. And to some extent, people think US may not want to say an Asia that really you know, uh, uh, has committed to a shared agenda of regional cooperation and community. Because of that, we are around the risk of excluding the US from regional affairs, undermining the decade-long US influence in this region. 
So when China rises, the U.S. tries to balance China uh, in uh, 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 working with its uh, um, security allies in this region. So like Japan, uh, Korea, and other uh, Philippines, et cetera, uh, even Australia. So that somehow undermines the trust between China and its regional uh, members. And economically, you know, China is becoming, uh, 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 like it or not, the center of regional economy. However, this also alarmed Washington. So it tried to move to create some new regional economic framework like TPP, Asia Pacific uh, 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 framework, to you know, challenge China's uh, 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 central position in regional economy. So these kind of trends you know, uh, really strain the uh, 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 confidence building and the trust building between China and its neighbors, and also between China and the United States. I think the core for Washington is really a, it realizes whether Asian countries are doomed to have much closer integrated political, economic, and security cooperation in the future, with or without the United States. And two, whether a rising China will uh, 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 inevitably have more uh, influence in the Asia Pacific region, even even if that comes as depends of some of the U.S. influence in this region. So these are a kind of, you know, two philosophical issues that political elite in Washington really have to figure out before they sit down to think about the policy towards Asia and towards China. Both Dr. Kill and Kevin raised their hands, but before I get to them, do you agree very quickly, Shinbo, with uh, Kevin's key point? that the Obama-Xi meeting, the last one at APEC, was amazingly successful. Do you agree with that? Uh, well, uh, we felt uh, pleasantly surprised with the outcome of this. <laughs> and uh, what's even more important... That's, that's Chinese for amazingly successful. <laughs> what's, what's more, I mean, uh, the US side was also uh, uh, pleasantly surprised because, you know, Obama, after losing the midterm election, yeah. but he was greeted very warmly in mm. Beijing, treating him like you know someone who is going to be the president of the United States for the next 10 years. How many hours did they spend together? 12, um, 12 hours? Uh, two, uh, 10 yeah. hours. 10 hours. The wow. first day for the, uh, for the uh, evening dinner, they were su supposed to stay together for uh, three hours, mm. from 6.30 to 9.30. But uh, then it uh, turned out to be uh, 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 protected for another two hours. Mm. So it's, they started from 9.30, ended in 11.30. Mm. So uh, two more hours than uh, yeah. originally planned. So th this is important because that was informal discussion, <coughs> very substantive, mm. very personal, you know, mm. uh, really, you know, uh, 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 free exchanges, yeah. yes. Now, Dr. Kill, I'm going to ask you a mischievous question as you, as you respond to what's been said earlier. Can you proceed, uh, President Park and Prime Minister Abe, to spend 10 hours together? Hope so. <laughs> hope so. I, I really, really hope so. Uh, I'm not uh, kind of uh, representing majority voices in Korea at the current situation, but uh, I'm always arguing or emphasizing that a summit meeting uh, without a substantive outcome is better than no meeting. Mm -hmm. Especially because Korea-Japan relations is, is very unique and very important. So l let's come back to 1998, South Korean President Kim Dae-jung, at that time, Japanese Prime Minister Oh Ji. So they made an agreement and declared the common future of the both countries. That's simple, we can come back to that spirit and respect that kind of agreement. Then we can resume anything in a positive direction. But let me add one thing about the change in strategic map in Northeast Asia. That comes from the rise of China and the US administration's kind of pivot to Asia strategy. Probably that kind of changing strategic map might to some degree affect Chinese, uh, Japanese Abe a government's kind of direction. Mm -hmm. Somebody call it there is historical revisionism. Somebody uh, call it there is a masochistic view of history, referring to South Korean foreign minister's comment yesterday. But the problem is that is change of strategic map surely affected the Japan's future path. Japanese leaders' kind of decision, which direction 
to drive the Japanese community to go. So that might quite mysteriously to affect uh, Korea-Japan relations. Mm. So that's why that the Japanese, uh, not all the Japanese people, still think Japan are the victim of the Second World War, Pacific War. Japan was the victim, first victim of the uh, atomic bombing. Mm. But that kind of psychology of victim of the Second World War shared by some Japanese people, that is a major kind of huddle to get out of this kind of uh, vicious cycle in yeah. Korea-Japan relations. Victim is concerned that Korea is the victim of the victim of Japan. <laughs> Okay, I, I both uh, Kevin and Akiko have raised their fingers to uh, respond. I'll give you the floor in a second. But before doing so, I need to prepare, for, prepare all of you for the second round. And for the second round, I think it's good, since the theme of the uh, panel is rebuilding trust, I want you all to also suggest concrete things that can be done that, to, that will help to rebuild trust. For example, I'm glad Dr. Kiel agreed with me that we should have a 10-hour summit meeting between uh, Prime Minister Abe and President Park. I think uh, even a 10-hour meeting without a substantive outcome is better than no meeting. That's a good example because it, it worked a magic for within Obama and Xi, clearly. So, Kevin, you're going to respond uh, to Shinbo's comments and then Akiko. I was, but now I've changed my mind. The, uh, <laughs> but this is fascinating because we've got, in this strategic triangle, the underpinning dynamic uh, in large... Which triangle are you referring to? This one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not the, including the United States, then? Not, <laughs> not no, no, just okay. these three. Just for the moment. <laughs> we'll come back to the Americans in a minute. The, um, but my, my, uh, I would like to hear a very, uh, uh, and this is your job, and I'm sorry for supplementing a question from our three representatives from Northeast Asia. Do they believe the history question is resolvable mm. in any form? Because we know that from all of our engagements in these relationships, and I've had engagement in all of them, is that it is the, um, the silent and very sometimes very noisy elephant in the room. If it is solvable, what's the formula between Japan and Korea and between Japan and China? What is the baseline here? There's a separate question about what's politically possible or not, but what is the baseline? Well, thirdly, are we saying that this must, must now wait the passage of yet another generation uh, before it is, quote, forgotten. Um, and there I'm not sure. I think in all of our families, looking at our respective ages, everyone would have a family narrative about their engagement in the Pacific War. I do, and I'm sure these folks do as well. So I just leave that to one side. On uh, Xing Bo's point about the region, um, I think he's right in this sense. Um, I now live in the United States. I'm at Harvard Kennedy School, and I take over as president of the Asia Society Policy Institute in New York fairly soon. Um, there is a general non-acceptance, I think, or non-awareness across American policy elites to the extent to which China is now such a central economic power, not just in Asia, but in many other regions in the world. This um, is not grasped intuitively in America. Um, it is seen by some in the academy. And when I say uh, the, the world is actually, the economic world is changing under America's feet, um, I'm usually stared at blankly. So Shingbo's point about that um, in terms of the United States is correct. But the point about common regional engagement is this. If it's a security concept, that has a different set of answers. If it's an economic concept around either uh, FTAP, uh, Free Trade for Asia and the Pacific, currently backed by China, or TPP as backed by the United States. That has its own internal disagreements. But you add the security concept, uh, frankly, it becomes even more complex. So the point is this, in terms of a Chinese concept of what would be a common dream for the region, it's um, uh, Xi Jinping's term. Is it a common dream for the region which in security and economic terms has America in? Or is it a common dream for the region which just has America in economic terms in? When I look at Xi Jinping's statements and he talks about the new Asian security concept, um, it is one which, as I read it, does not automatically seem to include the United States. And when I look at his um, uh, articulations at APEC about a dream for the region, it is an economy-wide Asia-Pacific concept. So therefore, you have an, a concept of Asian security regionalism, excluding the United States, 
perhaps. And you have an Asia-Pacific economic concept emanating from the same Chinese government saying the United States is in. And uh, frankly, my own view, having spent the best part of one year now thinking about this, that unless you embrace the lot, it won't work. On the core question which you have posed us, which is how do you begin to build manageable levels of strategic trust? Yeah. Okay, Akiko first. I'm going to come to you, Shinbo. Have you got a chance? Akiko, you... Okay, well, thank you very much. I believe... Um the, um, there are, um, in my understanding, two built-in stabilizers in East Asia. Um, one most fundamental is the deepening economic interdependence. Yeah. Everyone lose if they uh, uh, squabble each other. And this is a most fundamental built-in That's why I won my bets on yeah. China-Japan. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then the second uh, built-in stabilizer is the strategic understanding between China and the United States. Mm. Uh, as long as they have mutual understanding of, uh, and, and then they have s certain uh, you know, consensus about uh, what should be the role of the United States, what should be the role of China in uh, Asia-Pacific uh, region. Um, well, uh, from other countries' perspectives, uh, if the agreement is a condominium of dividing the areas into two spheres of influence, that we would not uh, you know, agree. But then, otherwise, uh, the existence of uh, uh, strategic understanding between the two uh, countries is beneficial. Uh, to uh, correct uh, any of the issues that uh, Japanese Ch uh, Chinese have or Japanese Koreans have, there are, in my understanding, limit um, of um, the um, uh, degeneration of relations. And uh, the, the, what, what we need more is uh, we need to create a third built-in stabilizer, which is a more trust. Uh, amongst uh, the regional countries. And if we could have these three built-in stabilizers, I think uh, East Asia uh, could be a lot uh, stabler uh, place. Um, as to Korea-Japan uh, relations, I think it is quite possible um, for the two leaders to meet uh, for an extended period of time to uh, discuss many issues. Well, um, so far it hasn't been uh, realized, but then uh, well, thanks to the um, organizers of various uh, uh, ASEAN-related meetings, um, the Mr. Abe and Mr. Park, because of the alphabetical order, uh, share a table together. <laughs> and then uh, they, I assume, uh, had yeah. a, a fairly good conversation, uh, which uh, both of them did not reveal what they <coughs> uh, uh, discussed. Um, yeah. But that well, is, is a good beginning. And yeah. then there are uh, issues of... Uh, uh, history we need to uh, sort out. And uh, as somebody who has studied international history uh, in the 19th, 20th century, um, it is the fact Japan colonized Korea. It is the fact Japan uh, made an aggressive war uh, in the 1930s. <coughs> and very few serious historians would uh, uh, deny uh, these uh, fundamental uh, facts. <coughs> um, there are certain extremists who uh, <coughs> tend to uh, um, revise uh, this type of views, mm. but uh, uh, their, you know, uh, 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 academic force is so weak uh, that I think uh, with the uh, uh, determination on the leader's level, uh, I think these uh, could be uh, managed. Okay. I'm looking at the clock very carefully because, we, you know, as you know, the clock uh, runs out very fast. I do want to, uh, Jinbo, you can respond to Kevin when you do your second round too quickly. But I do want to focus on specific uh, things that we can do, and I'll, just, I'll give some examples. And I, but I'm very glad, Akiko, you mentioned ASEAN's role. Mm -hmm. And that's, by the way, that's not the first time that ASEAN has played a role for Northeast Asia. I remember 10, 15 years ago, there were tensions within China and Japan, and the only face-saving way for the leaders of China and Japan uh, to meet was at an ASEAN meeting. So ASEAN actually plays an incredibly important silent diplomatic role, which is not recognized by many in the region. And I think ASEAN's role will also be very important in terms of rebuilding trust uh, in East Asia. But I'm going to give you three concrete, specific examples of uh, how to uh, rebuild uh, trust between the uh, various countries. One on history. I mean, the Germans and the French said, OK, let our historians sit together and write history books together. And so we agree on a common history, and that would help to resolve a lot of the tension. That's one concrete example. Second concrete example, uh, Japan has very wisely told Korea, 
oh, let us refer our dispute over our, our islands to the ICJ. Why doesn't Japan make the offer for Senkaku, the IU Islands, and say to China, we will refer the dispute to the ICJ? And as you know, in Southeast Asia, uh, Singapore and Malaysia, Indonesia and Malaysia have resolved their disputes through ICJ, and that's one way of uh, rebuilding trust. And within US and China, to pick a very uh, sensitive example, it's clear that one of the things that's really, that I think China finds quite naturally irritating and aggravating is that the United States is carrying on its sort of Cold War pattern of a very aggressive naval patrolling 10 to 12 miles off the shores of China. I think that's completely unnecessary. It's a Cold War relic. You don't pick up any information anymore from 10 to 12 miles offshore that you can't pick up from satellites and other sources. But it's, you know, it's a continuation of an old point pattern of behavior you no longer need in today's environment. That's another concrete thing that can be done. So these are examples of concrete things that can be done to rebuild trust uh, in the region. So uh, in that spirit, uh, Dr. Kill, what would your concrete, well, specific suggestion be? Well, as far as uh, history book uh, kind of co-editing by the countries concerned, yes, uh, Korea and Japan are on and off, uh, kind of uh, working on and off. off, kind of, kind of, uh, <laughs> the project is on and off. But we are continuing. Uh, uh, but as uh, Akihiko mentioned earlier, that exchange of visit, especially for youngsters, I think yeah. that is very productive and constructive, so-called Campus Asia project mm -hmm. that is uh, importantly initiated by the Sri Summit in 2010 mm. and they started to 2011. 100 students of each country are exchanging a visit and exchanging the credits of the, the shared the classes and uh, making a, a joint curriculum of the universities. It's still ongoing. This is rather a constructive project. Another one is initiated by a peace foundation, Korea and Japan, so-called the uh, Peace and Green Boat Project. For 10 days, 1,000 people from Korea and Japan, professionals, academicians, youngsters, journalists on board and cruise ship and cruising and stop over. You don't call it a love boat, huh? Oh, no, that's, I think that is a kind of a, a Yeah, this is a stop over many different ports of Korea and Japan. They shared the lectures, they kind of attended the same cultural activities. And I want to emphasize, there are many problems in between bilateral and trilateral relations. But we, that is, this is a time you would better highlight the success stories, the shared success stories. Not only the kind of cultural diplomacy, as, as well as some economic kind of cooperations. There are many big, good cases, Torrey industry, Industries, there is Japanese uh, global company on textiles and the fabric and advanced materials. 15 years ago, they invested to Korea, the joint ventures. There's a very lucrative business. Now they invest to China mm. and running the laboratories and research and development in Shanghai. And the Japanese mother company as a Korean joint venture companies of Tore have co-invested in Indonesia. This is a many success stories mm. and Sony and Samsung's kind of cooperations. Good, excellent. And Those are very good examples. Yeah, Thank you. I like the boat one. <laughs> <laughs> Simple. Uh, first, I want to uh, get respond back to, to Kevin, and then you give yeah, us a copy. Yeah. Um, his question about whether the history issue is reservable. Hmm. Um, I think it is, it is, or at least manageable. Uh, actually, uh, between China and Japan, we used to be very close to you know. Um, closing the gap on the history issue. Uh, one, I mean, in the past, the Japanese leaders, they already uh, made a statement acknowledging the aggression against China and the big casualties uh, it accrued to uh, people in China. Secondly, uh, they, they didn't go to uh, uh, visit the uh, Yasukuni Shrine, where the World War II uh, 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 A-class criminals were enshrined. And uh, thirdly, they tried to work with China to uh, solve the issue of uh, chemical weapons uh, left by the Japanese soldiers in China uh, 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 in World War II. So we were very close to you know, kind of solving these issues. But then, you know, uh, in the last several years, uh, the, the shift in Japan, uh, I think uh, uh, someone just mentioned this kind of uh, uh, political shift, strategic shift, because of the rise of China, 
Japan shifted from its, uh, liberalism and pacifism, pacifism to strategic realism. But also on history issues, there is a shift to historical revisionism. So leaders began to say, well, aggression is a term difficult to define. What do you mean by saying aggression? Okay. Uh, comfort women, no, that's you know, more or less a voluntary act, not really you know, uh, uh, forced by the Japanese soldiers. And then the leaders began to pay visit to Yasukuni right? So in many cases, it was not China or, or Korea that brought up the history issue at first hand, but rather you know, only when the Japanese leaders they began to defend the World War II history, paying visit to Yasukuni Shrine and doing these kind of things, this his issue came up again. So I think, you know, <coughs> if we follow the good example that said by the uh, previous Japanese leaders, and then, you know, uh, uh, and then get back to the right path, it's very likely we can leave this issue behind rather than, you know, uh, 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 put this in front of us. Um, on the US role in Asian security, um, I think it's not fair to say that uh, President Xi intends to exclude the U.S. from our regional security. It's not. Uh, even though in his statement he said, you know, Asian security affairs uh, ultimately should be managed by the Asian countries. But he added, we also welcome the constructive role played by the external powers and organizations. That's fair because, you know, if you look at the U.S. role in Asian security, they, they, they did a lot of things in the past, like the Vietnam War, the war in Afghanistan, Iraq. They, they didn't you know, solve the issue very well. So we think you know, at the end of the day, it has to be Asian countries to find their way out of these security challenges with this assistance yeah. of US and other uh, external actors. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, getting to your uh, uh, concern Question. about <laughs> what kind of specific approach we should uh, take in addition to this kind of leadership relationship, student exchange, I think the media is very important in Asian countries, in all this, or in, especially in the three countries, because this is an era of information. And the young generation, maybe they are more influenced by media rather than by their class uh, 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 work. So uh, if the media is just contented with you know, attracting audience, then they will make a lot of you know, sexy reports, uh, uh, provo provocative uh, 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 things. But <coughs> media is a business and industry. It should provide good products to its consumers, like other industries, like food industry. So the media, we should encourage them to become responsible media, you know, encouraging regional cooperation, mm -hmm. reconciliation between countries, uh, mm -hmm. building trust, promoting exchanges. So that's how, in yeah. the future, we should create a kind of a regional media platform mm. and create a kind of a media exchange program. Mm. You invite the major media people to your country, stay there for some time and you know, talk to the local people. Yeah. And this kind of exchanges should be very interesting and useful. Now I'm going to make a very naughty comment. The term responsible media may be an oxymoron. <laughs> Akihiko. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, because you're going to turn to the floor, I'm going to quickly get uh, Akihiko's and Kevin's suggestions on uh, concrete things, and then we'll throw the floor open to you, and then we've got to finish. I know, there are lot, I know many of your hands are coming up. Wow, so many. <laughs> Too many. Well, okay, then, very quickly. Then, 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 then I have rush, to be very rush. brief, but uh, yeah. I believe... Um, the, uh, there are already uh, much attempt of joint studies of histories among the historians of uh, the three countries. And in my understanding, there emerged a fair uh, amount of consensus, although uh, there are areas of disagreements among mm. historians, uh, such as specific number of victims of certain incident and specific numbers of these. There may be some differences of historians. But then I think... Uh, uh, the general um, um, understanding of uh, the difficulty uh, that the three countries faced in the early 20th century um, have been investigated fairly jointly. And um, so at, on, on the historian's level, there are uh, quite uh, uh, strong possibilities of mutual understanding, uh, understand uh, or uh, disagree or agree to disagree. 
uh, on certain uh, interpretation. But that's not natural in any kind of historical uh, studies. Um, the, uh, so I think um, the, the, the concrete, concrete of the matter concrete is... Measures. What? what concrete measures do you propose? Well, the, um, well I think uh, the, uh, the, the leadership level, uh, they should be mindful of uh, their, the impact of their statements. Hmm. Uh, and then so that's the, um, um, you know, uh, what is needed for the leadership level. And then in the level of, I think, media, I think there is a danger of too much simplification. Um, well, already now, now, you know, because the Yasukuni Shrine issue has been so much politicized that uh, the meaning of uh, somebody's visit may have been fixated into certain interpretations. But then if you look into the history of the shrine, then there are a lot of nuanced, uh, you know, uh, things going on. But then in the media, it uh, appears uh, impossible to see these nuances. And so I, I think... Um, um, so somehow, the, uh, uh, the, on the one hand, the leader should be mindful of the impact of the statement, and the media uh, should uh, make a report that uh, gives each issues in broader, uh, a more historically um, you know, uh, oriented uh, uh, perspective. And then I think what is needed uh, is the management of uh, uh, this year's uh, so-called anniversaries, uh, two anniversaries, mm -hmm. the 70th anniversary of the end of the Second World War, 50th anniversary of the diplomatic relations of Japan-Korea uh, since 1965. Um, I believe, uh, and I hope, uh, uh, the leaders of uh, the three countries uh, should be mindful uh, to make this anniversary um, the, uh, uh, the anniversary uh, to uh, celebrate the achievement of the past 50 years or 70 years instead of focusing too much on uh, what uh, brought about uh, the uh, uh, 1945 uh, and others. Um, the, uh, I believe, uh, of course, uh, uh, to do that, uh, the Japanese leader uh, should be candid about uh, Japan's um, uh, conducts uh, be, uh, th that lead to 1945. Kevin, it's just, you know, lots of hands coming up. Uh, uh, can you get a quick comment from you on concrete suggestions? Three you know, concrete I want to get to the floor ones. Very yes. Three concrete ones. Number yeah. one. Japanese leadership needs to declare that future Japanese prime ministers will not visit Yasukuni again. This is not just a Japan-China problem. It's a problem for most of us. And the reason is, if you walk inside the Yasukuni and go to the museum, it is a monstrously distorted view of history. Secondly, the equivalent would be if there was a cemetery in the middle of Berlin today in which latterly were interred the remains of Hitler, Goering and Goebbels, and annually the German Chancellor went to pay generic respect. I hate to say this so stridently with my Japanese friends in the room, but it is a huge stumbling block. And for friends of Japan in the region, I fail to see why the rest of us need to be constantly engaged in foreign policy uh, frictions which arise from this core question which can be uh, resolved by a single action. And that then creates an atmosphere where the other problems of history can be dealt with. The second point is common regional in, uh, institutions or common regional vision, as Xingbo said before. Mm. I think there's enough in the public language of the Americans and the Japanese and the Chinese to start moving towards a common regional vision. Um, as you know, we've got APEC, we've got um, uh, the various ASEAN-related institutions, we have the ARF. Um, I think our model, Kishore, to go back to Singapore and ASEAN, should be an expanded ASEAN in this sense. You have been remarkably successful as a regional institution which has turned conflict into peace and into common economic opportunity. Look at the history of ASEAN over 40 years. It's terrific, frankly, against what it was. Therefore, my strong concrete suggestion is with ASEAN at the core, mindful of the ASEAN example, we use the East Asian Summit, which is ASEAN-based, to evolve a common concept of regional, of a regional community for the future, which incorporates both the security and the economic dimensions. It's one of the projects I intend to launch this year through the Asia Society Policy Institute. And thirdly, um, for China, Japan and the rest of the region to merge the concepts of TPP and FTAP on the basis of trade principles. 
The argument from the trade policy specialists is that TPP is a high quality agreement and FTAP would be a geopolitical agreement. I think there is a capacity to find a middle point there, which then causes us to incorporate common economic engagement mm. as a continued net regional advantage and confidence builder and trust builder, rather than turning into yet another terrain for conflict. <coughs> Yeah, excellent suggestions, excellent suggestions. Great, uh, now nice. there's so many hands. So I'm gonna suggest this, uh, there are exactly 10 minutes left. Uh, each one of you, if you don't mind, stand up, uh, state your name and quickly pose a question. We'll take all the questions in one go, uh, but we have to finish all the questions in exactly five minutes. So please be very short and sharp as, as, as the panelists have been. Then we'll give five minutes for the panelists to respond and we'll have a very robust ending. So we'll start with the ladies in front here. And we get to everybody quickly, please. Doctor, I'm from Korea. As a Korean woman, I'd like to I'd like to raise one issue that uh, about uh, sexual slave issues. But even though there are many issues about uh, Korean uh, Japanese uh, relationships, that there are many great uh, Japanese people who inofficially apologize for that issue. But uh, we, as a Korean, we only need official apologies from uh, Japanese leadership, but they don't, so I'm so sorry about that. And then there are only 55 uh, comfort women uh, alive at this moment. We don't have any m much time to uh, for official apologies. As uh, Dr. Tanaka said that it's a uh, 50th anniversary of uh, between Japan and uh, Korea relationship and then the end of uh, Second World War. And then I really want Japanese people to do official apologies for the all uh, people of the world. This is yeah. not only Korean yeah. women's issue, but also Thank everybody's you. issue, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Human okay, next. Rights. Yes. Quickly, please. Huh? Yes, Tian Wei, Sharp CCTV. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I just want to say something about the media, because many of you talk about that. Usually, the media is always to be blamed on whatever difficult issues. But having said that, though, I'm a member of the International Media Council for the WEF, and I have to brief everyone. This year, we have an enormous amount of discussion about what the role of the media for the betterment of the society as a whole, given the Middle East and many other areas. So having said that, though, my question is, I think there are two issues that we are talking about here. One is that the enormous amount of cooperative spirits that I see not only with uh, Kishore, but also all the panelists here to get things right so that the relations go ahead, which is important. But on the other hand, may I just ask a question that can we just easily brush off all the facts and so-called move the relations further to a quote unquote better situation by brushing off all of the important facts and realities. I think that's not realistic and I want to invite the views coming from our panelists. Okay, Gideon. Thank you. Uh, Gideon Rachman, Financial Times. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask uh, uh, the, the perception I have and a few others have that, that there's been a change in the tone of Chinese foreign policy in the last three months, a more conciliatory approach to Japan, to Vietnam, and also a report I read, I'd just be interested to know if it's accurate, of a speech by Mr. Wang Yang in, in Washington where he apparently said that China had no desire to challenge a US-led global order. Uh, was that an accurate report and can it be taken at face value? Okay, Minister Wahid, and then come to you, yes. yes. And then we come to the gentleman there. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Uh, my name is Wahid from Malaysia. Now, Malaysia and many other ASEAN countries have, uh, do enjoy a great relationship between um, those countries with uh, Korea, um, China, uh, Japan, and plus Australia too. Now, uh, in the case of um, Japan, although Japan was an aggressor uh, to Malaysia uh, during the Second World War, uh, but we've seen the, um, those issues being you know, almost forgotten. Uh, for example, uh, my grandmother would never forgive the Japanese because she lost her sister. Uh, but um, my uh, father, uh, and myself, we don't have any ill feelings towards Japan. And in fact, in my case, uh, uh, our relationship with Japan is one of gratitude because Japan, within three decades of the Second World War, uh, invested into Malaysia and brought uh, Malaysia up uh, to become an industrialized uh, nation where uh, a quarter of our GDP is now contributed by the manufacturing sector and a big portion of that was contributed by uh, Japanese investors. So my question is that um, 
why is it that in Malaysia we can overcome embrace this, and overcome welcome this, this yeah. in fact welcome Japan where uh, other countries may have some difficulties. Okay. Thank you. We're going to take just two more questions. This one and this one. I'm sorry. Please rush. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Harvey Liwanag. I'm one of the global shapers attending this meeting. And I'm from the Philippines. Uh, we're all aware of the <coughs> tension in the Spratlys in the South China Sea as a result of China's aggressive behavior. The Philippines has filed a case in the international court. The Philippines wants to dialogue with China multilaterally through ASEAN, for example. But China has always refused to approach it multilaterally. China insists on a bilateral approach. What are your thoughts on this? Okay, uh, gentleman over there has raised his hand frequently. I'm going to be those two quickly. And you're going to, we are literally, uh, the clock is ticking. We have exactly five minutes. Vuk Yeramich, uh, editor in chief of uh, Horizons. Uh, there are tumults in the European theater, geopolitical tumults with Russia uh, getting uh, frictions, frictions between we Russia and the West. And that is causing Russia's forced pivot to Asia. So, uh, how is that uh, influencing, if at all, geopolitical and geoeconomic equation in Asia through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, yeah. through the new energy deals? So the emergence of Russia in the theater, does it change things at all? Okay, please. Now, we have, by the way, you only have four minutes, so each one of you has only one minute. You can't respond to all the questions. Respond to one or two, and then we'll... Please, please, go ahead. Yes. Very quickly. Ken, yeah, Ken Choi uh, from Chosen Daily Newspaper Korea. I'll be more responsible on the future reporting. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, what we're missing in this region is some sort of a military arrangement. Uh, whereas, like in Europe, we have NATO, and it's impossible to have a war in that region. And whereas this uh, in Asia, like the Philippine gentleman mentioned, that there is no security arrangements that sort of prevents this. You know, simply make war impossible in the region. And why aren't we talking about this? Okay, we'll go in reverse order. Kevin, we'll start with you. One minute, please. I'm, I'm sorry I won't cut you off for one minute. That's good. 40 seconds for you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Shingbor. I'll interrupt on you too. Gideon, to respond to your question, uh, the key speech is um, uh, Xi Jinping's 30 November speech last year, partially reported in the Chinese media. It outlines um, an approach uh, to the world which um, has China very much on the front foot, uh, China with a new... Uh, constructive global um, uh, diplomacy. And the key phrase, I think, is for China, assuming what it describes as a new great power diplomacy with Chinese characteristics, cooperating with the rest of the world on the construction of the future international order. It's the key speech. I think Wang Yang's speech partly reflects that. Secondly, uh, on the uh, question of the ICJ in the Philippines that was asked before, uh, can I just say this? I think a smart solution for everybody, as you ASEANs have demonstrated, is to use the ICJ comprehensively. And everyone wants different approaches to that. And thirdly, on the... No, well, uh, we got one minute. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I want to give each one of them one minute. <laughs> okay. Sorry. And thirdly, that's the end. <laughs> okay. Uh, please. Well, um, I'm timing on, on the issue of comfort of women, um, I personally uh, feel for the victims who are becoming older and older. And um, we need to do uh, uh, things that could uh, consult them. Uh, and um, I would like to mention that the Japanese uh, had been uh, trying to do uh, to alleviate uh, the, uh, uh, the damage uh, done to uh, these victims by establishing what we call Asia Women's Fund. And, uh, it is a joint activity by the government and the private sector. And um, the government uh, used the uh, government money to handle the fund uh, with, with, the, with, with, the, with the donations. And then I, I'm one of those who uh, contributed a little amount of donation to the Asian Women's Fund. But then this activity, unfortunately, was not uh, accepted very much by the Korean, uh, uh, I think, uh, some of the Korean victims and others. And so I would like to hope okay. uh, that uh, the leaders uh, should create a wiser uh, a framework in, in which uh, okay, uh, substantively the victims will be comfortable. Okay. The Thank clock you. is very brutal, it's not me. <laughs> uh, very quickly, um, on the middle row, I think it can do a better job by A, putting facts in perspective, and B, reporting more uh, rational voice rather than you know, this extreme voice in certain cases. For China and Philippines, I think the problem is if, if China and Philippines have a dispute of a particular 
uh, islands, what's the use of bringing other Asian countries like Singapore in this uh, equation? So, and also, you know, China and Philippines used to reach some agreement, uh, cooperation projects, but it was after, you know, the, your current president, Aquino, who came to power, and he changed his mind. So that's how the domestic politics could spill over into this issue. And final question is Russia. Uh, we think Russia is also an Asian power. So Russia is expected to play a constructive role in regional security affairs. Thank you. It seems to be uh, very difficult uh, for all major Eastern countries to rebuild the trust uh, in the region. But I think we should uh, try first to kind of stop uh, the, the game of self-defeating, first of all. And let me finally quote uh, former president of uh, South Africa, Nelson Mandela. It always seems impossible until it's really done. Yes. Hmm. Exactly. So I, I think you'll all agree that uh, we've had a remarkable discussion today because, you know, we've gone into very deep dive into history, we've looked at the big picture, we look at the larger strategic trends, we pointed out the negative dimensions, the positive dimensions. By the end of the day, what I take away uh, from this panel actually is a renewed sense of optimism that even though some of the challenges will remain, there are what Akiko said at the beginning, many strategic stabilizers in the region, uh, driven by the economic and trade integration uh, in the region, driven by new generation emerging and driven by the ability of these countries now to talk frankly to each other about issues for which they could not discuss before. And that is, I think, a very positive new development. So I leave this panel feeling optimistic and I hope you will feel leaving, leave this panel feeling optimistic too. And with that, please join me in thanking the panelists. <clears throat>